<laughs> the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network. Hello, my name is Maya Seal, and today I'm going to be adding to the conversation of whether psychedelics can treat dementia. And I'm going to be adding some novel perspectives from cognitive network neuroscience that I think are useful. Part of my inspiration for this talk came from the emerging clinical focus on psychedelics and association with dementia. For example, there is a phase two LSD trial in the works looking at LSD as a therapeutic for Alzheimer's disease. In addition, there is a John Hopkins study currently in recruitment looking at psilocybin for depression in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk more about these terms in a second. Another part of my inspiration for this topic came as a result of my exploration of the science of brain networks. After falling in love with the discipline, I slowly began to realize that there were these two silos of research that were converging, but not really talking to each other much. For example, research on brain network alterations have greatly amplified our understanding of dementia. And similarly, research on psychedelics and brain network alterations has greatly amplified our understanding of psychedelics. So I got curious, what does this interaction look like? And can it inform the clinical trials that I just mentioned? Before I dive in, I just wanna cover some basics. The first is that I would not recommend giving psychedelics to anyone with dementia at this point. It is extremely understandable to consider this because dementia is a disease of despair and people are desperate for any treatment that they can get their hands on. There's a lack of effective treatments currently on the market and the ones that do, have heavy side effects and they're symptomatic in nature. Plus there is a huge promise of psychedelics for treating all these other disorders. And there's also clinical trials underway looking at LSD and psilocybin for dementia related disorders. However, I wanna caution that the brain is a complex system and we just don't have the data yet. I know how devastating dementia can be. I lost my grandfather to dementia many years ago. And even though psychedelics have radically transformed my own life and my own sense of self, if my grandpa were still alive today, I personally would not be considering giving him psychedelics. We are dealing with an extremely complex set of interactions. And after doing rigorous literature views, I personally found it to be mind boggling. The next thing I wanna cover is the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Mild cognitive impairment, you are typically still functioning in life and dementia affects your life functioning, but these are both diseases that represent abnormal cognitive decline due to disease. And they can be seen as a timeline moving from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. As well, dementia is an umbrella term. Dementia represents many diseases that connect brain pathology with cognition issues, and there's is many types of dementia. For example, Alzheimer's pathology is made up of pathological proteins that are misfolded and form plaques and tangles that cause neurodegeneration. Vascular pathology is related to block to reduce blood flow, and there are many, many types of dementias, but Alzheimer's disease is the most common. But there's a mystery here. Because research has shown that having a brain disease is not the same as having dementia. And you can have two people with similar degrees and types of brain pathology, but they can live very different lives with one being completely healthy and another having dementia. So the question is, how are some people able to resist the effects of brain disease and retain cognitive health? To unravel this mystery, we'll look at network science to unlock the interconnected world of network neuroscience so we can connect brain networks with cognitive function and cognitive network neuroscience. Beginning with network science, the models created in network science, like all models, are representations that serve to simplify complexity in ways that generate insight. So what can networks model? 
basically anything that you can represent with dots connected by lines. And these dots are just independent objects. And these lines can be any type of relationship between these objects. And you can model airports, roadways, and many other things, including this image of artists that are connected in network with other artists they have displayed art with and is in itself kind of art. And this has a surprising ability to understand complex interconnected systems. Another key concept within network science is modularity. So a network that has modularity means it is organized into distinct subnetworks, where within each subnetwork, there is some level of specialization and they are more connected with each other than they are with outside the subnetwork. In addition, network science allows us to quantify this in the term called modularity. Networks that have modularity also have two key concepts called segregation and integration. And many networks function with a balance of both segregation and integration, but having too much of either can lead to pathology. So having too much integration can lead to de-differentiation and a lack of specialization. Too much segregation can lead to disconnection and different groups in that network not talking to each other enough. And it's also too important to understand that segregation and integration are just opposites. So how has this helped us understand the human brain network? Well, it has shown us that brain function is enabled by modular brain organization and that it is organized into segregated, unique, large-scale systems and that there are multiple scales of modular organization. And these scales range from the molecules that are passed through synapses synapses that are made inside of neurons and the many neurons that make up circuits, the sets of circuits that make up areas and the groups of areas that make up systems. When looking at cognitive network neuroscience, we're looking at how we can construct systems out of areas. So how do we make a brain system? Well, first we start with brain areas and brain areas are not just regions. They are regions that have been rigorously analyzed through a convergence of a variety of measurement tools for distinct information processing roles. And there are different ways to do this. We organize them into systems by connecting them in time. So if two brain areas fire together, then we can say that they are connected and we can build a network of different areas of the brain that are connected at the same time. And we can identify brain systems that have a functional purpose. Looking at this more closely, here the hubs of the default mode network are not necessarily next to each other, but they are connected to each other with these um, wispy kind of physical connections. But you can see that there's this interrelationship between structure where it constrains function, but functional networks are distinct from the structure that constrains them. So how do these segregated systems within someone's brain change with age? Well, they tend to desegregate with healthy aging. And if you look at the red, group or the blue group and you move from left to right, you can almost watch it explode. And that's a visualization of these networks desegregating in real time. In addition, network neuroscience represents a frontier of human knowledge. There are so many fascinating open questions, like how many large scale brain systems are there? How do these brain systems relate to cognition? And how do these brain systems vary from person to person? And can we model mental illness as deficits in these systems interactions? If you find any of these questions interesting, I highly encourage you to engage with network neuroscience more, and you're welcome to reach out to me for resources. Moving back to cognition. We can define cognition as your brain's ability to use various functions to process information into acquiring knowledge and performing tasks. And so there's a bunch of different cognitive functions that the brain uses to do this, but this is not the only thing that the mind does. And I don't want to restrict everything that the brain does to just cognition. And we can see from network neuroscience that cognitive functions rely on the dynamic use of brain systems to complete tasks. So we can imagine these brain systems as tools in the brain's toolbox. So many brain systems work together to perform cognitive functions. Many cognitive functions work together to do everyday tasks. So what does your brain look like on dementia? Well, what happens is that different types of brain disease converge into neurodegeneration and inflammation that harm brain system efficiency. And to stay functional, these typically segregated and modular systems then seek reinforcements from other areas. 
they then begin to activate other regions, and this naturally leads to desegregation. And when this desegregation happens in multiple systems, this leads to dedifferentiation, as you can see here on the left. And from this, chaos ensues. Considering that brain function relies on these brain systems, which are these tools in the brain's toolbox, then cognitive decline is like your brain's tools are beginning to merge together. And this always conjures up very absurdist and Dadaist ideas like this bicycle wheel from Marcel Duchamp, like good luck sitting in that chair or riding that bike or this dolly image generator that created this uh, hairbrush and a spoon for me. Um, good luck trying to do either of those things with that. <laughs> And this has been shown in research where dedifferentiation of functional system leads to worse cognitive and motor ability. To summarize all of these processes when, within somebody, we look at the resting state. This is because the resting state has been shown to reflect past states. And because of this, we can look at resting state network segregation as a summary of past network organization. And thanks to network neuroscience, we can quantify this history. So then we can conceive as the resting state as a history book for past brain states. And because it's a history book, it's also a window into what future decline will look like. So considering that segregation is a way to quantify the brain's like cognitive resource reserve, the faster that the brain loses this resource reserve, the faster the cognition will decline in the future. And this has been shown in research where a longitudinal fMRI study found that segregation changes are predictive of decline up to 10 years past the last scan. And this is completely independent of brain pathology and neurodegeneration. So from this, we can imagine a model where increases in brain pathology through neurodegeneration, decline network efficiency, and through desegregation end up causing brain system dedifferentiation and lead to abnormal cognitive decline. But what about when you're tripping on acid? Well, when you're tripping on acid, there is dedifferentiation at many skills of the brain while you're tripping from the default systems to executive to sensory systems. And this causes typically segregated systems to be undifferentiated. And this mirrors impairments in executive functioning and working memory while tripping. So my question is, is this dedifferentiation a depletion of brain resources? So we can imagine our model from earlier where LSD or psilocybin will increase brain system dedifferentiation and lead to more abnormal cognitive decline, possibly. However, there is an immense amount of nuance. For example, it is still unknown if psychedelics could alter the history that's represented in the resting state brain. And the question is, would this still be predictive of future decline? In addition, psychedelics represent a distinct mode of brain functioning that could, we don't really know yet, but they could have different patterns of dedifferentiation from dementia. And studies looking at this are still yet to be published or undertaken. The next thing I wanna look at is that they could cause dedifferentiation for a short period that is distinct from the long-term. And this is because the long-term effects on brain networks from psychedelics are still largely a mystery. So both of these studies look at psilocybin, but one found that it reduced segregation one month after, and the other found that there were no long-term effects three months after. And these are both in healthy young volunteers, but ultimately they both agree that their limited sample size prevents them from actually making conclusions. And we need a sample size of at least 60 to actually make any type of conclusion. So the question is, what are the effects of psychedelics, if any at all, on network dedifferentiation a day after, a week after, a year after, 10 years after? There's so much unknown here. And the last piece of nuance I wanna look at is that psychedelics could have unique effects on people with dementia. Neuroimaging studies have shown us that set and setting matters in neuroimaging studies on psychedelics as well. So the network effects of psychedelics have been shown to differ based off of who is studied which means it's difficult to predict the influence on dementia based on other groups. But this also conjures up the idea of perhaps psychedelic assisted cognitive training might be something that could be useful. There have been some vague investigations in rat studies, but there has been limited talk about doing something like this in humans. Ultimately though, psychedelic brain states have no comparator. 
psychedelics reveal just how little we actually understand about the brain, and they literally add to the complexity of the brain. And because of this, I want to return to the clinical trials that have been actually done on psychedelics looking at dementia. And this is a phase one trial looking at LSD in healthy older volunteers. It is a study that demonstrates safety in preparation for demonstrating efficacy of LSD for treating Alzheimer's disease. It just means that we can only speculate what's going to happen when you give people with dementia psychedelics until we use higher doses, larger samples. We look at people with dementia and we have a follow-up of at least one year. So to summarize everything, we can think of many reasons why psychedelics can be helpful by looking at all these different mechanisms that these reviews have covered and looked into. But after doing my own literature review, I wonder, are we overlooking some reasons that psychedelics could harm dementia? For example, I did not find any review looking at LSD or psilocybin for dementia or Alzheimer's disease that investigated how psychedelic neuroplasticity could be either harmful or helpful. For example, both of these substances have neuroplasticity that depends on activating mTOR, and mTOR activation can worsen Alzheimer's pathology. And if this doesn't make too much sense to you, don't worry about it. I guess your takeaway from this, hopefully, is that there are so many potential factors that could be harmful or helpful, and we just need to wait till we have hard data before we can make any type of conclusions. And I wonder if we're overlooking potential conflicts of interest. For example, there have been two attempts to patent psychedelics for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. In addition, there are companies who are advertising psychedelic-assisted therapy to treat dementia, despite the fact there is no hard evidence to show that they are actually effective or won't increase their cognitive decline. And to sum it all up, what I've shown you in this talk is just a tiny window of all the relevant interactions. The brain is extremely complex, but we don't need to have precise understanding of mechanisms to do clinical trials. We just need to be careful, which is why I want to return back to the John Hopkins study looking at psilocybin for depression in people with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. This study is a psychosocial study design, meaning it is targeting the social and emotional aspects of these diseases. But as I hopefully have shown, is that psilocybin and LSD are possibly able to interact with cognitive decline itself, which means it is not just a psychosocial intervention, but is a cognitive one, and it warrants some key changes. For example, their current measure, quality of life in Alzheimer's disease, is a secondary measure that has some measures for cognitive changes, but is not sensitive enough to capture all of the cognitive changes. For example, I recommend adding the clinical dementia rating scale sum of boxes because this is what's used in clinical trials that are looking at cognitive interventions with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. It is much better at tracing the progression of early cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. Second, the current follow-up period of six months maximum is just not long enough to fully capture mild cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's dementia or any type of dementia, because these diseases have timescales that progress from two to 10 years. So I recommend instead doing at least a one to two year minimum follow-up. And if researchers implement these suggestions, then we can finally have some data on how psilocybin affects the progression of cognitive decline. And to summarize, the current clinical focus has been looking at psychedelics and dementia related to brain disease and related to psychosocial side effects. But no psychedelic for dementia review article has addressed the network pathology that connects brain disease with dementia, and that's network dedifferentiation. And in conclusion, I just want to highlight some future research directions. So modifying the John Hopkins trial, like I just mentioned, but also if you had unlimited money, adding a PET scan so you could see how it affects amyloid beta pathology and tau pathology. I also am calling for review articles that consider a lot more perspectives on how psychedelics will interact with these diseases, such as the role of mTOR and the role of brain system dedifferentiation and many other mechanisms that I identified in my literature review but didn't mention in this talk. Lastly, I'm really excited for long-term functional neuroimaging studies with sufficient sample sizes, at least 60, because then we'll finally understand how psychedelics impact the brain in the long term. 
Thank you all for coming to my talk. I hope you left with a better understanding of dementia and network neuroscience and maybe just a teeny bit of healthy skepticism on whether psychedelics will be helpful for dementia.